So our first uh, speaker is uh, Vicky Pratt, who is really uh, known to many of us here in the room. And um, she will give us an update on EMS recommendations for clinical pharmacogenetic allele selection. And I apologize again that I gave away a, a small teaser yesterday in my own talk. But uh, <laughs> she will give you all the details. All right. So we're going to try to make... I do not have 70 slides, so I hope everybody's not too disappointed about that. And I'm going to try to figure out where I'm going to stand. Um, so... Um, we're going to talk about the AMP recommendations, and we'll see if I can get this to forward. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe not. Let's see. Let's try. Um, all right. Somebody's got, to, somebody's got to help because I don't know. I can't get it to advance. Oh, did... Uh, the top one. I went, all right. Uh, did we go past where I needed to go? All right. Um, so I can't do this without a team. So um, I'm a, one of the co-chairs of the AMP Pharmacogenetic Working Group. Many of the folks are, are already here in, in the audience here. Um, but um, I'm one of the co-chairs, Karen Weck from UNC, the other co-chair, uh, Larry Cavallari, uh, Mackenzie Fulmer, Andrea Gadick, uh, Huda Hashad, Yuan Ji, Lisa Kalman, Rena Lee, Ann Moyer, Stuart Scott, Ron Ben Shaikh, and Michelle Rural Carrillo. So it, um, one of the things... Um, so I'm going to tell a bit of a story. So Lisa and I, we were talking and we're like going, we need, and Kelly, I think might've been there too. I'm like, we need standardization and pharmacogenetic testing. And so Lisa and I put into AMP a recommendation or a proposal to start this sort of PGX work group. They did it. They ignored us for a while. They ignored us for a while. Um, and so until sort of the, as Terry Manolio talked about the genomic medicine conferences, in genomic medicine 10, then they're like, we need assay standardization. So then AMP is like going, well, we've got this proposal, let's go. And so it was like the major green light. Lisa and I started getting everybody together um, and really to put this group together to really develop what a minimum set of variants or a must test list that all laboratories, all clinical laboratories, I'm not going to talk about research, clinical laboratories should be doing. Um, and so um, we gathered friends of Vicki and Lisa and, and added other ones in. One of the good thing about AMP is that always we include a junior member. So it's a trainee, somebody who's in their fellowship, has to have a junior member on. So getting them to get our future leaders in PGX and getting them up to speed. So um, we started in 2017. And then every year we've published one recommendation after another. So as Andrea let the news slip, um, but we've sort of been making it unofficial, and wouldn't let me put it in the slides yet because it's not available online, um, but DPYD has been accepted. Um, I will tell you there are about 8 to 10 variants in Tier 1. So um, we're, that's going to really change how we're doing DPYD testing, hopefully. Okay, so we had to sort of get a framework together of what we were going to do. How are we going to sort of evaluate all these alleles? And one of, I should say, one of my really by uh, so um, I'm not going to talk, you know, everybody knows here I don't need to talk about star alleles um, uh, to this group. Um, and diplotypes and genotypes um, and using to predict the phenotype. We'll skip that. Um, but, you know, when, uh, when Lisa and I have done other projects and we've looked at, like, the GetRM data, and you see all these labs testing all these different things, and, and the problem with pharmacogenetics, everybody well knows, is if no variant is detected, it gets called a star one. So if you test one variant, that's fine, uh, but... Every, but there still may be variants there that aren't tested. So we really need to create that standardization. So genome, the Genome Medicine 10 really said for assay 
standardization in 2017. AMP gave us the green light and we, we hit the ground running. So when we, so how do we reduce variability among, um, among uh, genes or, or testing? is, well, we can test for all known alleles. And, you know, I know this is out of date, but it's from last week or so, but it's probably, Charity, <laughs> stop! <laughs> um, so, you know, there's more than 117, and I'm not going to talk. <laughs> Um, uh, we can, and we're, you know, we could sequence everything, and, and that's probably coming in the future. Um, but then we're going to have lots of li variants of unknown significance that we'll have to work out. Um, and so there's still problems with some of the short reads and with the hybrid alleles, and you know, I'm not going to go into the details about that. And again, the variants of unknown significance and how we're going to do that. Um, come on. Hello, it doesn't like me. There it goes. Um, but, okay, so we decided to use a strategy that um, ACMG used for cystic fibrosis and that really defined a minimum set of alleles or variants to be used in clinical testing. And then having lived through cystic fibrosis, everybody goes, well, my assay is better than your assay because I do more. Um, and so we were, so the other thing is, is like, okay, we're going to say here's what the minimum set, but then we're going to do a tier two and add the ones on there that we still think might be clinically relevant, but may not meet all the criteria um, that, that, that we have put together. It still does not like me. Eh, it's not personal. Okay, so, um, so what would you, we defined tier one is it had to have a well character, characterized effect on the function of the protein and or alter gene expression. Um, it had to have an appreciable minor allele frequency. So I don't, so it's, and some of this is very gene, gene dependent because some of the genes, the variants are much more common. Some of the other genes, if we look at TPMT and T15 are more rare. So we can't have one, like one standard line in the sand. Um, one of the things that I required and I'm very passionate about, and it's my bias, having lived through cystic fibrosis multiple times, is that there has to be a reference material. There has to be a positive DNA. It has to, there has to be a control to ensure quality and genetic testing. Um, if there's not a control, there's not assurance of quality. And, we want, and I wanted to make sure there's, there was quality assurance. And then, the t and then when we looked at like 2D6, what was the technical feasibility of including that variant into tier one recommendations? Um, because we downgraded some because they were way more difficult to include in tier one. And so we downgraded them maybe to tier, tier two. And then we added our extended panel or our tier two recommendations where we actually said, N um, if you're going to do this, maybe they don't might meet the allele frequency cutoff. Maybe there's not a reference material. There was some reason why they don't. And we have the documentation for all that of why we didn't, we put it into tier two or didn't include it at all. Um, or didn't include it at all. And in some of our more recent recommendations, we actually say, do not test this variant. <laughs> I'm like going, this does not make sense. Do not test for this variant. Um, but so, and then, so everything else is, there's, there's, there were reasons why it wasn't included. Okay. Maybe, there. So first, and so I'm just going to run through this real quick. Our first publication was in 2018 on 2C19 as we developed the framework and worked through it. Then we did, um, then we did 2C9. And you will notice the titles get longer and longer and longer. It's because everybody's like going, I want to get on board the Vicky train and, um, and get our name on these publications. Uh, so then we did, well, since we did 2C9, then we looked at all the other warfarin variants and made the recommendations for that. I'm, I mean, I could give you slides of what all the variants are. You guys don't remember, so that's okay. 
Then we did our most challenging one to date, which was 2D6. Um, hybrids, 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 tier two. Again, titles are getting longer. TPMT, no T15. Uh, a year later, last year we published uh, 3A4, 3A5, and DPYD should be uh, online available soon. So part of these collaborations, we've been, I mean, I've always worked cl closely with Lisa Kalman and the CDC and the GetRM projects and trying to get reference materials for clinical laboratories. So part of our collaboration, it's not an official collaboration. It's a, it's a friends that go shopping collaboration. Um, and so we, uh, we were, and so we were working together with, with Lisa Common, the CDC, and the GetRM project to actually try to, when we're working on these recommendations, uh, um, characterize more additional Coriel DNAs and put out a companion paper um, with this to make sure that there's reference materials to ensure quality and testing. So um, the recommendations are intended to promote standardization in PGX across laboratories, inform clinical lab professionals when designing validating PGX assays, complement other guidelines. We're not, we're not making any recommendations for CPIC or whatever, but we're supporting CPIC using um, the data in PharmGKB to inform our, inform our, our, our allele selection as we work through curating them. And then, um, of course, there's other genes um, that are, are planned and in progress, so. Um, I just want to acknowledge our AMP, our AMP staff and, and, and wonderful people at AMP that so far has supported us, us through this pro project. Um, we are starting on paper number eight. Um, and then we've already got another proposal in for another three to four more papers after that. So, um, so um, like I said, get on the Vicky train. Um, and um, so if you have any questions, you want to complain about what alleles we put in it or don't, or, you know, or why we didn't put in it, talk to me, I'll tell you why. And, um, but we are going to reassess everything we've done to date and all recommendations to date. So some of the other ones we didn't, we weren't quite in sync with um, GetRM, we're more in sync now. So, so we do have reference materials from some of the earlier recommendations, so things will move from tier two to tier one now that we have reference materials and, and reevaluate where we are. So that's all I had, and I hopefully did not take my 20 minutes up. Charity, stop putting in 2D6 alleles. <laughs> <laughs> or, or get reference materials for them, give for Coriel. Okay. Submit to Coriel Stop reference it. materials. <laughs> okay, this is, how much time do I have? <laughs> so I commend AMP and, this, and, and you and all of the authors that have started this initiative because it's something that we desperately needed and that I use and that others, I'm sure, are using to design their panels, et cetera, et cetera, towards this goal. Thank you very much. It's the team. Uh, uh, you know, I still give credit. It's the team. So, so it's, it's obvious that you guys are stratifying uh, SNPs based on very transparent criteria. So do this, does it meet this? Yes, 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 et cetera. So, for example, if I take the 2D6 tier one and tier two and look at the mutations that I find in 2D6 within my cohort. So this is an Aust Europeans of Caucasian or Caucasians of European ancestry, uh, yes. It's whatever. Yes, this ancestry, us <laughs> white, you know, white people. Um, and I stratify them based on coverage using tier one. I grab, and these are functional, alleles, so not star one or um, star 35, et cetera, et cetera. I'll grab about 50% using that tier one coverage. Then if I include star one and star 35, I'll go up to about 90% or 88%. 
Then if I apply the tier two variance to that, I only gain coverage of about 2% within right, my Right, because they're the less common variants. Right, exactly. And but, we do have some caveats in there about but special population. I still have a, about a 10% gap of variance within my cohort, my, you know, our, our pa patient population that's not covered by any tier one or tier two variant for said gene. Now, I understand that this is not, this is the first stab and it's the first step and it's the first. It's, well, it's not and perfect. we're not saying we're no. testing everybody absolutely either. Not, or absolutely getting not. Them all. But I'm wondering as the spearheader of this initiative, what, how do you plan to tackle these kinds of gaps in the future? For example, as new alleles are submitted for the gene and we know more frequency information, maybe some of those are gonna move. And that's, and that's true. They may move as, as frequency data. I mean, frequency data is what we're taking as a moment in time. Right. And frequency data will change and evolve as we gather more information. So I think I also just, I, I, it's, a, it's a question and a comment. So how will, you, how will your group deal with that? A comment to the audience that if you have novel alleles or these variants of unknown significance in these pharmacogenes, especially the ones that are cataloged on FarmVar, please submit those because this is the only way that we can feed this information and get it into a standard of testing, right? If you don't look for it, you don't find it. If you find it and just ignore it, it's, I don't know, just the same. But another big knowledge gap is really function. Right. That really prevents a lot of these um, alleles to be moved into tier one. So the frequency might not really be the issue. It's unknown or in the function. function. So this is where we really need to also um, close the gap. So is there maybe one Sorry. other? Else <laughs> not that I want to cut you totally off. No, I, I just wanted one I, <laughs> the one more comment. I would ask for, I would, I would suggest that the committee considers finding reference materials for all three, all three genotypes for a specific variant. So not just having a sample that's HET, but having a sample that's also homozygous mutant. I know that that's difficult, but I would challenge your group to, to, to go towards that goal. So actually, Lisa Kalman and I, um, we, we've got an idea on some things, so we'll, we'll, we'll see what we, I can't guarantee that we're gonna do that, especially for rare variants. All right. Yeah, I think we do really our best to include a variety of different genotypes for a small study that is a heterozygous and homozygous samples. We pick both for these uh, GetRM projects if uh, that is, is available. Possible. If we can find it. Yeah. We have maybe time for one more quick question if there is, is one. Well, chat. Very quick one. You said there's other genes. What's, what's the next one you're working on? I can't tell you. <laughs> can you tell us what letter it starts with? <laughs> well, that was a very nice try, that file, so, and I really keep my tongue very close because otherwise I'm no longer friends with uh, Vicky and she cuts me off the train. <laughs> yeah, we'll boot you off the Vicky train. <laughs> All right, if there are no more questions, thank you, Vicki, for presenting. Thank you. And so it is my... Uh,